I want to be able to speak with you uh, on a wide range of issues um, around um, how uh, the foundation uh, sees the progress in the financial services industry uh, and some of the um, initiatives that you're working on. And I want to sort of draw a dotted line uh, into all that is happening that is being called innovation is in financial services today. And you're the best person to speak to on this because uh, you've seen both sides of the equation. You've seen the financial institutions and now you're running a foundation working with, from the grassroots up uh, uh, helping societies uh, build their financial infrastructure, right? So tell us what uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is doing in financial services today. So indeed, there is today 1.7 billion people on the planet who are still unbanked. Uh, it's an ugly word to describe a person generally poor, generally rural, based that only has cash as a way to transact on for day-to-day -day financial transactions. If you take Africa as a continent, 400 million African adults are in this situation today, poor, poor rural persons. So the goal of financial services for the poor is to uh, connect these people to the economy by helping financial service providers provide um, uh, the adequate financial services, including payments uh, to these people so that they can improve their lives in terms of the security, in terms of managing their money better, in terms of escaping from poverty. That is essentially the goal. Connect them so that they can use uh, digital financial services to improve their lives. We know from many types of research that giving them this access improves considerably their capacity to absorb shocks uh, than dealing with cash, either positive things like marriages or uh, shocks like death or accidents. Um, and we also know that um, having uh, a electronic digital way to access financial services enables them to save money better uh, and also to essentially manage their lives better. Uh, it is unfortunate to say, Emmanuel, but it's very expensive to be poor and to be in this situation uh, because basically you have to, to expend energy or pay to pay. If you want to go to pay the tuition of a child, sometimes you may have to walk five kilometers to actually hand down the cash. Yeah, so there are three aspects of financial services. One is payments or access yeah. to a financial infrastructure. Uh, second would be credit. Uh, and third would be wealth creation. That's how financial yeah. services configured uh, in the commercial sense. Uh, first question I have for you is like, um, what is the size of uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation today and how much of that is, uh, is um, dedicated uh, funding for, for what you do, financial services? Yes. The Gates Foundation annual uh, impact budget is in excess of $3.5 billion. Financial services for the poor is a relatively small strategy, uh, about $130 million. Um, but... Um, it is a strategy that has its own objectives, but it's also transversal because we support other strategies because many other strategies need essentially payments uh, for them to work. How the Gates Foundation works? Is there a virtuous uh, connectivity between the different programs or the different areas that you work in? Yes, there yeah. is common objectives. And the best example uh, that was perhaps even amplified by the COVID pandemic is the need to, for governments to be able to pay, um, to support various people and either people who work in the agricultural sector or who are poor. And so digitizing the uh, government payments is a very transversal strategy that touches many of the things that we do at the Gates Foundation so if I were to ask you to prioritize the top three or five 
projects that you're working on, what would they be? In the financial services for the poor, we are focused on infrastructure to make financial inclusion happen, one. And secondly, we are focused on gender aspects uh, because one of the facts also is that there is a huge gender gap in access to financial services or mobile phone technology. And that is a, uh, you know, a barrier we need to overcome. On the infrastructure side, um, what we believe is that um, the best way to, to enable the scaling of, of the effort to cover 1.7 billion people ultimately is to deploy uh, national or even regional digital payment platforms that interconnect all of the players on the ground in a real-time retail payment system where money can flow from one person to the other instantaneously in real time at a super cheap uh, processing cost. The other important infrastructure that is very much connected to payments is digital identity. So in the process of onboarding the 1.7 billion people, how do you manage the identity piece of this and the associated KYC aspects of this? So our basic effort is to help the national stakeholders like governments, central banks, private sector uh, banks and providers to collaborate, to deploy this infrastructure that then enables a country-wide or even regional-wide platform in, uh, 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 to, to serve the poor. To give you a few examples of such endeavors, uh, for example, we are assisting the Central Bank of Pakistan to deploy what they call MPG, uh, which is a mobile payment gateway, which is a country-wide real-time payment platform that interconnects all of the financial service providers in the country, banks, but also the digital financial service providers like mobile money or, uh, or others in one single platform with the effect that um, uh, one person who has a mobile wallet on a mobile phone can participate in the economy by receiving money from other wallets, paying money from her wallet to a bank account, and all of the combinations thereof, including paying to merchants. Another example we have on a regional level in Africa is in, the, in Western Africa. There is an economic and monetary union of eight country called YMU. They share a single currency and they have a single central bank. And we are helping uh, the central bank there in association with the African Development Bank deploy such a platform on a regional level. The two that you've just described uh, sounds like programs that should be funded by the World Bank, for example, uh, rather than by an impact agency. So when you draw the line between uh, what needs to be done commercially and what needs to be done uh, as an impact uh, agenda? We work a lot, of course, on the ground with the World Bank teams. Um, what we actually, with our strength uh, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is to foster innovation. And this real-time payment platform, as you know, uh, uh, you know, when we got to know each other some seven, eight years ago, there was no real-time payment platforms uh, anywhere. Today, this is becoming common, and I would dare to say that Africa and Asia are actually leading the way in deploying real-time payment platforms. So we are at the forefront of these projects where we help create the architecture and uh, lead these projects to deployment. After that, the operation of this project gets into the more traditional financing model uh, that we can that we all know well. But do you fund existing programs uh, uh, or do you initiate your own programs, put your own people on, on the ground yes. and stuff? So, so we do three things. Uh, uh, we provide philanthropic capital, uh, which is a grant 
So we don't expect that this money is returned. We, we fund it uh, for impact. We provide technical assistance uh, because um, deploying such platforms actually requires skills. And then we provide assets. And one of the assets is um, an open source software that's called Mojaloop that we have commissioned the development of. And that is actually an open source free software that, uh, that people can use to create, to create these platforms without having to reinvent the wheel of technology. The software is essentially a, a reference implementation for an interoperable payment platform. Uh, this is something that my team has developed with some fintech companies uh, and now has been spun off into its own foundation, the Mojaloop Foundation, where we are partnering with other philanthropic organizations like Omidyar and Rockefeller, but also where we have Google uh, partnering with us and PhonePay from India partnering with us. To sum up, we provide a number of, uh, 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 of assistance, uh, philanthropic capital, technical assistance, assets to the stakeholders on the ground. So they carry out the projects. We help them with these various ways uh, that I mentioned. So in the area of payments, uh, there are any number of payment initiatives in any country, uh, in the UK, in Southeast Asia, in China, in Africa. And uh, it used to be that payments was uh, even for rich people, even for uh, the people with access to finance, payments used to be an expensive idea. But over time, um, technology has made payment, the, the cost of building a payments platform, it, it just collapsed. So uh, in fact, if you look at the annual reports of Visa and MasterCard, um, they, they don't make money from processing anymore because there are three core revenues. The most important is marketing. Um, in fact, they outsource a lot of their processing uh, down to the regional levels. Um, and, and, you know, and they also outsourced it to Wirecard, which then outsourced it to other subprime processing companies uh, because the payments became a volume game. It's, uh, it's a game that that the um, commercial institutions were not making money on it anymore. Yeah. So the idea of making payments cheap or accessible to poor people or, or people without access to, um, to infrastructure uh, has become a lot easier. So when a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation goes into a country like Indonesia and looks at payments, what do you see? How do you engage? And what are your priorities as a result? Yeah. So we are driven by the needs of serving the poor. So the question we need to ask is, how does a payment platform need to look like to be usable, accepted by the poorest on the planet? If you want to serve the poor, uh, there are a number of characteristics that, that uh, are required. One, the payment needs to be instantaneous between parties, even if they are not on the same network. The interoperability is a huge need because if people can only transact on the same network, even very cheap, they, they can only do so much. And the, the needs of the poor are much broader than this. So having an interoperable, instantaneous payment platform that is super cheap, that is an innovation. That doesn't didn't exist a few years ago. And that's where we are at in order to serve the poor. For example, what Mojaloop is a good example of. How do you do that? And secondly, if you, if you think about a merchant transaction, not only it needs to be instantaneous, but it needs to be irrevocable because the merchant, you know, you pay with your phone, you walk away with, for, with the goods. There is no way now to undo this transaction and so on. And then on the payment platform side, we consider the payment platforms that need to be run like a utility, essentially not for profit, uh, or I call it a little bit different, I call it not for loss. 
So essentially, all the profit that is made needs to be reinvested in the platform so that the platform can absorb the volume, but also be super secure and reliable. So um, we consider that a payment platform needs to be accessible for competitive offerings. And to be efficient for this, these platforms need to be processed at humongous number of transactions of very small value. Like in East Africa, one of the innovations that happened was the sale of solar batteries, uh, where people can actually lease the solar battery and pay every day a small amount. A good example of, of where this gets would certainly be the UPI in India. They just run over 2 billion transactions per, per month with an exponential uh, growth rate. There are any number of players playing in exactly the field that you've just described. There are fintech startups, there are the traditional yes. banks, in some cases, central bank currencies and so on. Some of them are conflicting, but some of them are competing. Um, I do believe that uh, a number of players, when they say that they want to make payments more accessible to the poor, actually all they are doing is trying to extend their customer base to be a profitable business. Uh, but on the other hand, the cost of payments uh, has been collapsing. And in fact, this in initiative where you have the open source platform that you've just described uh, collapses the cost even more. There's this um, competitive uh, dynamics taking place in the area of payments at the moment. Um, and uh, you seem to be working uh, with central banks, uh, but not necessarily at the commercial layer. What happens when you come across a country like Indonesia or China which already has um, commercial platforms uh, that provide this ubiquity. At the country level, you make sure that there is a level playing field for everyone and that um, there is a platform that is run as a utility. Because if you have platforms run uh, for profit, then basically you create again silos that don't talk to each other. And so I think the governments and central banks, they have this view that interoperability is very important from the consumer perspective at the end of the day. It's great to have uh, innovation on rails, payment rails, but it's also important that you ensure that from a consumer perspective, that there is like a uniform environment where you are not taxed. Does the Gate Foundation take a stake in fintechs and startups? We have one example. We invested in Bcash in uh, Bangladesh early on, but this is not our general model. Our mo more general model is grants to either, um, um, you know, like central banks or associations. Like, for example, we work with SAD in SADC, the Southern African Development Community. We work with the banking association there. And so we help them financially and technically to enhance the existing Cyrus system in South Africa, to extend to digital financial service providers, mobile money providers, and multiple currencies. What is your position on emerging yeah. technologies like blockchain and so on? We have a very a specific focus on looking at new technologies, both on the identity and payment side. And blockchain obviously is one of these. We tend to take what's best and put it to use. Uh, so for example, Orjad Loop is based on, a, on a component called Interledger Protocol that borrows a lot of um, blockchain concepts, can connect a traditional payment system with a blockchain-based system, but it's not a blockchain in itself. We look at technologies like um, uh, cryptocurrencies, more in the context of central bank currencies, the digital currencies for settlement. Uh, we have not engaged in uh, cryptocurrencies as being directly useful for use, the, for use by the poorest. Uh, for many reasons. First, because many of the people I mentioned, they don't have smartphones, so they are just not equipped uh, with the power to, to deal with the crypto. But also because um, 
uh, we follow uh, the concept of uh, the fact that every payment platform in the country must be fully regulated um, and hence the local currencies is used because basically that is what the stakeholders we help they want. If you take uh, distressed countries like Mozambique and, and Venezuela and so on, the poor get right into crypto because it's a matter of survival for them. Yeah. In distressed situations, um, the, the, your, the, the desperately poor uh, cannot wait and they need to make uh, decisions. Your programs appear to be moving more toward the established infrastructure uh, and not taking a view uh, of uh, circumstances where the desperately poor define their own currency, define their own response, what they need to do. I agree that we work with incumbents, but at the same time, we want to ensure that the people using this at the end of the day are protected, the system is secure, that the system is not used for fraud, uh, money laundering, and that's why it's important that um, what we do is in conjunction with regulations, but we also work with regulators to, of course, uh, take into account the innovations and implement them in the countries as the innovations are coming. And that's a huge part of our work too. What is the position of the foundation to, um, to central bank digital currency? Right now, the, the view that, uh, based on our research, is that CBDC-based settlement um, is something that is quite interesting because it, it can, it, one of the um, frictions in an interoperable system is inter-provider settlements. If I send you an instantaneous payment, you receive it. But if we, you and I are on a different provider, then our two providers have to settle between them. And that process today can prove to be a fr friction depending on the setup of the particular country or central bank. And uh, uh, it could be that the research showed that CBDC could be something that can remove that friction. Would you provide funding for developing countries to set up their own central bank digital currency? We actually yeah. haven't received yet any demand for such assistance. And if it comes, we would look at it. Uh, in the context of gradual adoption, perhaps looking at settlement. Uh, but the extreme scenario of um, CBDC being available all the way down to the users uh, is an interesting case. A lot more research needs to be done on whether how useful is it, what are the on-ramps, off-ramps to cash, because cash is still needed. Actually, a lot, a lot has already happened. Uh, I think yeah. one of the earliest yeah. central bank digital currency was uh, Uruguay, uh, and then now Sweden, and then of course China. Yeah. So there are enough case studies now, and actually the technology is a lot simpler than we imagine it to yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't that be the simplest, fastest um, you know, mode of uh, deploying uh, payments infrastructure takes care of all the interoperability issues that you've been talking about. And there, it also fits your model of working with the uh, policymakers. So again, you have to look at this um, as obvious as it could appear to us. I think you have to ask yourself the questions of how useful and how impactful is this to the poorest, which is a quite different thing. Are they equipped? to deal with cryptocurrency at all. Like, do they have a smartphone? The smartphones are getting cheaper and so on, but by all means, not every of these 1.7 billion people will have a smartphone anytime soon. So that's kind of basic problem number one. Uh, and by the way, a smartphone requires charging every day. Bar phone, you charge it once every week or two weeks and you can still transact with it. One other thing is the, yes. the, the on and off ramps. So it's great you receive some CBDC version of a rupee on your phone, uh, but if you can't do anything with it and you can't cash it out, what good is it for you? We all see the possible useful, usefulness of this. But before you actually take the drastic step of, of helping deploy such a technology on a super large scale at 2 billion transactions per month, that's, a, that's quite a different endeavor. Let me test you on two more points. The profit pools 
in traditional payments infrastructure. One is the interchange and the other is uh, foreign exchange, FX. Yeah. The cross-border initiatives that you have, FX is a big thing. It, it's uh, almost no innovation in payment would get into payments if it wasn't for the FX. Um, you know, and even when they collapse the FX from the traditional banks, what the banks charge, it is still very profitable. It's still the defining uh, reason for being in cross-border payments. Um, you know, are you saying that uh, anyone who is in payments for the poor uh, cannot be profitable? It's a utility and therefore there is no income and, uh, and, and therefore you either have to uh, totally dismantle uh, both FX and uh, interchange. Um, you know, because, no, I'm, uh, I'm, yeah. you know, you, you need a system that, that actually completely, um, you know, dismantles both. Uh, yeah. You know, is that how I'm you think about cross-border payment? Yeah. So I'm not saying that at all. Actually, um, uh, I mentioned this. Uh, there are two different uh, layers of uh, services. There is the payment rails, which is typically collaborative and not for loss. And then there are the competitive offerings of accounts, wallets, and services. For example, like the first mobile money implementation in Africa, in Kenya, and PESA uh, more than 10 years ago, they have proven two things. One, that um, it's uh, useful for the poor. Secondly, that money can be made by providing such services to the poor. And so uh, the the and, and today, there are more than 250 mobile money operations across every Africa. This is a great innovation. The, the, the only issue so far is that each one of these mobile money operations is a silo. It's not interoperable. So the next wave of innovation is this payment platform that interconnects them all. So we are not saying that they should provide services for free, but we ensure at least that the platform that interconnects them all is super efficient, you provide it as a utility. And so the interchange fee between providers is super low, if not zero, but they are still uh, uh, charging their customers in the way they see fit for the you know, product uh, target and, and, and so on. Same for um, cross-border transactions. Um, when you have two such platforms in two neighbor countries, then you can imagine that you can interconnect them through value-added Forex providers. So we are not taking away uh, by this any business. What we are making sure is that the infrastructure that connects them is super efficient. We do hope that they uh, make their customers benefit from the savings they do. You, because of the lower interchange rate. Do you have, yeah. uh, do you have initiatives in uh, community currencies? Because I would imagine that if you have cross uh, functionalities with other parts of, uh, the, pro of, of the foundation, uh, community currencies appear to be not only being a payment platform or a play payment token, uh, it also, it actually monetizes um, activity. Um, you know, and, and, and makes communities sustainable. Do you have a view on that? Are you encouraging it? Are you funding any of these uh, community currencies? We are not funding uh, any uh, that I know. This is an innovation that uh, we are favorable to. We see them uh, uh, as a great education tool for financial, you know, literacy. Great example um, uh, are especially in Asia, uh, the, the very small credit unions of which there are many in Indonesia, Philippines, they are a great enabler of financial services for the poor, but they suffer greatly because they are isolated, they are not connected to the greater you know, payment system of the country, of the planet. We work with the uh, World Council for Credit Union, the Asian Council of Credit Unions, so that the credit unions organize themselves in platforms as well, that they can be then connected to larger national or regional platforms. So, so we see that as a great um, enabler from grassroots financial 
literacy and inclusion, and that can then grow into these these bigger platforms that uh, that we do. Give me a sense of yeah. what what yeah. Uh, the foundation is doing in the area of credit. So, as I mentioned, we consider that um, accounts and uh, wallet provision is a commercial endeavor that, and we encourage many, many providers to play on the playing field. The same is for what I would call the new Ubers, the applications. Of course, credit is the basic one. In Kenya, uh, there are several credit systems that run, that are connected to the mobile money system of the country. We are again, encouraging partners to foster innovation on, on, on creating fintech or, uh, you know, um, uh, great other ideas for these applications. One example I mentioned earlier is uh, Mcopa Solar, which is a company uh, that provides these solar batteries and that essentially invented a new way because when you look at the poor households, it's not that they uh, it's not that they 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 don't have money they do but they can only spend so much at a particular time as a Kenyan household you can't buy a solar battery because it's like a huge expense but you can pay one dollar a day you know uh, to actually slowly but surely get ownership and right. that would not be possible without a payment platform that is capable of processing humongous amounts of transactions of one dollar or less a day and so the platform is making this possible and these new ubers as i call them of uh, of for financial services we hope to see many many of them in the transportation space in agriculture space in uh you know, energy space. This is a huge innovation space, uh, which we are interested to see flourish. And we work with other partners to incentivize this innovation. Why doesn't the foundation take a stake in, in uh, specific projects or specific because startups? Our theory of change is that helping deploy these digital platforms is the best way to scale it and, and the best way to give floor to these innovators. That's what we choose to invest on. Uh, many other philanthropies are active in many other of these spaces. Many, uh, you know, venture capitalists are in bed. There is a lot of money for innovation. And we think that, that this is not a space where we will make an impact. We really think that our impact is this huge scale of getting 1.7 billion people connected. What is the KPI? of uh, the financial services sector, um, you know, um, portion of yes. uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So how many people get connected? How many people use the system? How many women have reached uh, the system uh, and not only men? Closing the gender gap. Costa, it's been really wonderful speaking to you. 